This is the Washington State Indivisible Podcast. I'm your host, Stephen Cox. This week, we officially launch our new series devoted to the 2022 midterm election. We know that there are a lot of people looking to get involved, and with good reason, because so much is going to be riding on the outcome of the midterms. So we have teamed up with Indivisible Vashon for a podcast series that will take us all the way through to the election, with volunteer opportunities, up-to-date information on where we can be focusing our energy for the biggest return, plus interviews with candidates, national and regional organizers, and much more. That is all next. While it is still officially 2021, the 2022 midterm election looms just around the corner. And for those of us here in Washington state, we are looking for ways to get involved, uh, not just here at home to hold on to a congressional seat and potentially flip another one, but also look to key races across the country where we can make an impact because we know that so much rides on Democrats keeping majorities in both the House and the Senate. And we also know that it's going to be an uphill battle for a variety of reasons, which we will get to today. For this project, I am proud to announce that this podcast is teaming up with Indivisible Vashon and its leader, Kevin Jones, for an ongoing series of podcasts that will lay out a comprehensive plan of attack for Washington Indivisibles to really have an impact on next year's election. And with that, it is my pleasure to introduce my friend, Kevin Jones. Kevin, I've been looking forward to this, man. Um, I'm really ready to dive into you. Stefan, I am I'm so happy that you were able to give me a call and talk about this series of how people can find opportunities to volunteer and get that outcome that we're looking for at the end of 2022. Yeah, I'm, I'm ready to dive in. Everybody knows how important this is, and we'll get to that in, in just a, a moment. And, and in fact, you know, let's actually start there because we're going to talk strategy. We're going to talk data. But just to kind of set the stage, how do you see the stakes of the 2022 election? You know, we we all worked uh, and and love the Biden agenda, which is really sort of tilting right now on some pivotal decisions that are going to be coming out of the uh, out of the House and the Senate. And and even with the thin margins we have, it's difficult to make progress without those margins. Uh, we are not going to be looking at, at a very happy time, you know, for progressives. Uh, the Biden agenda is um, is not going to move forward if we don't maintain both the House and the Senate. And I'm going to be a little bit darker in my assessment and say that if the Republicans take either the House or the Senate, uh, Biden's legislative agenda is effectively dead uh, at that point. And we, of course, both know that uh, voter suppression and voter subversion laws in key states uh, with those, the GOP can they can essentially steal the next election. So the really in, in my in my mind, and I think in a lot of other people's minds, the stakes simply don't get much higher. So um, as as we've as we've talked about, indivisibles did manage to help the Democrats win across the board in 2020. Uh, the margin, as you mentioned in the House, uh, much smaller than we'd hoped. Uh, the Senate, as we know, is 50-50 after a, that big push in Georgia. So I'll just ask you, looking at how all that shook out in 2020, what are some of the lessons that we learned from the 2020 election that you think we might apply to the 2022 election? Well, there's, there's a couple of things as we were, you know, finding opportunities for people to engage in the last cycle. The most important thing people can do is find something they enjoy doing. I, I get asked all the time, what's the most important? What's the most impactful? Well, the most impactful thing that you're going to do is what you're willing to do on a regular basis. So find something you like, whether that's texting, whether that's talking to voters, whether that's you know writing a you know 30 or 40 postcards as you as you go through the evening news or after dinner. Uh, find something you like. That is really important. And you know the other thing that we know is that conservatives are really motivated to rever- reverse their losses, right? We were we were so frustrated when Trump was elected, and and we know that that same emotion is now uh, taking place on uh, with conservatives. So, but we need to realize that we know we have the power to achieve the outcome that we want. You know, we won that Senate race so narrowly in 2020, right? The the margin between Warnock and uh, his competitor was so close and Purdue was so close, they had to go to a runoff. And that was the you know, what hinged our success of tying in the Senate. So we know the margins are challenging, but we know we can win. And that's what we need to focus on is making sure that we do that. 
So enthusiasm, and that is driven in large part, as you say, by finding something that you like. I think that's very sage advice. So um, we're going to look a lot at the national field today, but uh, we would absolutely be terribly remiss if we did not talk about where we can put our focus on right here at home in Washington. Uh, we know that there is at least one very pivotal uh, congressional race. What are you thinking about? How are you thinking about the work that we need to do here at home for 2022? Well, first of all, in 2021, we can also make contributions. Thank you for mentioning uh, that. Yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to sprint yes. on past that. We're, we're not past the 2021 election. There's a lot left to do there. Sure. Absolutely. Well, and then the best opportunity is uh, postcards for Washington. And uh, you, can, you can find them at postcards4wa.org. It's, it's the number four. So postcards, the number four, and wa.org. And... They, they have nearly all of their postcard addresses have now been distributed, but not all of them. So, you know, we only have about a month or so now, less than a month before the election here in Washington. But that is something that people can do. And if you you can also find them by going out onto the Indivisible Vashon uh, web page. So that's IndivisibleVashon.org. At the very top of the home page, click on the Get Out the Vote banner. And that'll take you to the page of Battleground States. And there's Washington. Scroll down the list, find Washington, click on that page, and you'll find postcards for Washington. But you're also going to find opportunities to donate to those candidates that the postcards for Washington folks have, have put their support behind. So that's one thing people can do you know, right now, just in the next uh, you know, two to three weeks. Um, the other thing is you did mention the uh, Congressional District 8 race in that Washington. Where I live. Yep. So Congresswoman awesome. Kim Schreier. Um, you know, uh, we knew we knew that was a tough race because that district was drawn to straddle the Cascade Mountains, right? So it has a fair number of eastern and western Washington voters. But Kim's election margin was the smallest of all of the congressional races uh, this last election cycle. She only won by 3.6%. The next possible race, you mentioned flipping a seat, that would very likely be uh, Jamie Herrera Butler's race in, in the third congressional district, which is in Southwest Washington around Vancouver. But Jamie won her race by 13%, 10 points more than, than Kim Schreier. So we, if we look at those numbers, we know that we need to be supporting Dr. Schreier. We also can think about whether we can flip Herrera Butler. Since she voted to support uh, the impeachment of the president, of the past president, uh, you know, she may be facing some headwinds, although I can tell you that she did outraise her Republican challengers in the first quarter this year. So um, it's, it's, it'd be interesting to watch that race, and I hope we can have a chance to, to keep an eye on that as we go forward with the series. I was not aware that she had outraised her uh, potential Republican opponents, and I'm, I know that everybody is going to be looking that at that race as a uh, as a possible national bellwether, really, for the uh, the small number, sadly small number of Republican elected officials who did vote uh, to impeach. So. Um, ultimately, we are going to wind up focusing on specific states and races. I would love to just very briefly, uh, if you could just give us a little bit of a peek, a little bit of an insight into how you would like to make that determination. How are you crunching numbers? How, how are you looking at this? Yeah, good question. Um, and, and this is based on work that was done for the 2020 election. Um, in that, I started looking at where were other national organizations focusing their time and effort? And it pretty quickly turned out that, you know, they're looking at the historically close races. So as you mentioned, you know, those uh, 31 House seats that were decided by less than a 4% margin, that is the first place to start looking, but also paying attention to what the other national groups are doing, because that gives us some good insights as well. But the, the other, so thinking about where those close races are, there's a few other things to consider. For example, in Pennsylvania, California, and Texas, each of them have four close races out of the 2020 election. And the thing about calling into a state, we know that we're talking to voters, but we know voters talk to voters. So 
if we call into a state that has, you know, four close races, we might just talk to one voter in one district, but we can expect that they're going to share their thoughts with others. So calling states with a high number of close seats is one strategy. And for example, Iowa has three seats that are close, which I was really not expecting. But uh, so Iowa has, um, it, it definitely has my attention. Interesting. I didn't know that about Iowa. So in addition to the states that have a number of competitive races, what, what are some of the other factors that you might be considering? Well, the, the other thing is, is we have to now focus this year on both the House and the Senate. Of course, we don't have to focus on the White House. Thank goodness for that. But uh, as you mentioned earlier, you know, in 2020, the House looked very safe. And indeed, you know, we maintained the House. But now those numbers are really thin. So if we look at Pennsylvania, California and Texas and Iowa, for example, those those have a lot of close elections. But there's only one close Senate race um, across all of those different states. And so we need to focus some of our energy on making sure that we keep the Senate or maybe even grow the number of Senate seats that are held by progressive candidates. So if we look at the states that have close Senate races, we're talking Arizona, Georgia, Nevada, and Wisconsin. So all of a sudden, the list of probably really, you know, candidate states that have close races that give us a chance to maintain the House and the Senate. Now we're talking Pennsylvania, California, Texas, Iowa, Arizona, Georgia, Nevada, and Wisconsin. That's 18 close House seats and eight close Senate seats. So then we're really kind of bringing them into play, I would say, to be able to, to advance the margins we have. All of this to me is, is, is it's a little bit like an SAT problem, you know, so you, know so you have this many states with this many seats in play and but this one doesn't have a, a Senate race and this one does. And I'm really glad that you're the one handling this because that's not how my brain works. <laughs> so uh, so I'm, I'm grateful you're the one who's going to be crunching the numbers. So um, as I mentioned, there are so many unknowns right now. Um, the outcome of the infrastructure uh, and reconciliation packages, for example, is going to it's going to impact the race in ways that we're not aware of right now. Um, we also know that, uh, well, we don't know who the candidates are in a lot of these races. And so being that we are as early as we are, but that we know that people really do want to get involved at some level, what are some things that people can be doing right now? A, one really important opportunity is to do voter registration in those districts that are we know are going to be close. And uh, it is challenging to find opportunities for that. Uh, Center for Common Ground is an excellent organization that does voter registration, focusing on, on communities of color. And they are represented on those get out the vote pages on the Indivisible Vashon uh, website. Uh, and we're looking for more opportunities like that. The other is the existing progressive incumbents. So there are definitely opportunities to build support for those uh, candidates who are going to be facing an, a challenge as we go forward into 2022. Okay. Well, the, I, and I should mention also for people watching and listening that all the information that Kevin is talking about uh, can be found in the show notes and at indivisiblepodcast.org. Let's briefly touch on redistricting uh, because mm -hmm. a lot of analysts believe that the Republicans can actually take the majority in the House by redistricting alone. So this is one of the many factors that is going to make 2022 an uphill climb. What are your thoughts on redistricting and how it's going to impact things here? Well, I'm glad you asked, but it is a really challenging problem to figure out what the implications of redistricting are, and not only here at home in Washington state, but also in these other states across the country. So the first thing to realize is redistricting is not going to impact any of those U.S. Senate races. U.S. Senate races, sure. the entire state votes for a senator to represent the entire state. So no matter how they're divvied up within the state, all of those votes get counted for the outcome of those Senate races. So we can wipe our brow and not worry too much about those Senate just races. Just the House, of course, we're focusing on there, yeah. Just the House. So here's, but, but here's why redistricting alone makes control of the U.S. House really, really tight. 
So, and here, here's, and this gets a little complicated. So let me kind of walk through it step by step. Um, I looked at how the different competitive states that we mentioned earlier, you know, how they do their redistricting. Okay. And so it turns out that there's nine close house races in four states. And those four states are pretty, uh, pr pretty unlikely to do any significant gerrymandering. Okay. So like Arizona, California, Nevada, Iowa, those are close races. Those states either have independent commissions or Democrats in their legislature or Democratic governor that can kind of keep the districting maybe hopefully a level playing field. But what that means is those nine seats, if they're really close, you know, if you say, well, the odds are that they're going to be roughly split, right? 50-50, except of course there's nine of them. So the Dems and, or the Republicans are going to come out ahead by one if they were to split evenly. Okay, so what that means is, uh, um, you know, those 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 races um, we can we can put some effort into and have some confidence that, that that they're competitive. Now, there's eight close races in Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Texas, and Georgia. And as soon as I mention Texas and Georgia, everybody's like, "Well, they're going to be gerrymandered as as far as they can." And and you're right, they will be. So there's eight close house races in states that are very likely to redistrict in a way that's going to be super hard for us to win those races. There's also two new house seats in Texas because of the census. And Texas, you can imagine they're going to work really hard to make those Republican seats. So now we have the eight close house races, the two new seats, that's 10 that are likely to go into the Republican side of the ledger, or the win-loss column. And right now we only have 10 seat margin in the U.S. House. So that's why it's going to be very, very close. Yes, it is. <laughs> so, OK, I, you know, at this point, I, I, I almost, you know, this is going to be uh, broadcast both as a visual and as an audio medium. And I, I feel like uh, uh, in, in the future and we're going to be doing future episodes of these, we may actually want to incorporate some uh, some visual aids just so people can kind of follow along on the map here. There are a lot of moving parts. I'm just going to ask you to. Uh, given everything we just talked about, give a few recommendations. And again, with the caveat that this is extraordinarily early right now, let's start with the House. For the U.S. House, right now, where would you like to potentially see people put their effort? So there's four states that people can pick from. Uh, the Arizona, where we'd be um, talking about two really close races. California, which has four really close races, Nevada, which has two, and Iowa, which has three. And those are the best opportunities to support candidates that have the minimum likelihood of being influenced by gerrymandering. So um, uh, I, I would look for those states of being places that we can put our effort. Um, the odds are we're not going to be shut down because of, you know, Republican hijinks in their in their redistricting process. OK. And then uh, you mentioned also in our uh, discussions before we get started that there are a couple of states that have Democratic governors that reduces the lock likelihood of partisan gerrymandering there, too, as well. Right. That is true. Uh, Pennsylvania and Wisconsin. Uh, both have Democratic governors. And so uh, it's going to be a tug of war, uh, right, between who wins out, the legislator or the governor. Uh, but, you know, there's a pretty fair chance that uh, that we're going to have a level playing field uh, to be able to um, to elect to win some of those close races. All right. Oh, and, and then so in the states, as we mentioned, that are impervious to gerrymandering, uh, the, the, the United States Senate, uh, where are you thinking that we might wind up putting our focus there? Um, there, Arizona and Nevada, I think, are the two primary focus areas that I'm recommending right now. And as, as you mentioned, it's early, so we're still taking a look. Mm -hmm. But the reason that um, the, the, the part of the reason for thinking about Arizona and Nevada is these are also states that are really important for the House. And so the benefit 
of thinking about supporting the Senate races is, again, we're calling into one state, working with you know an organization that we develop relationships with already, talking to voters who have to cast a vote for both the representative and the senator. So we're trying to influence one person to get two outcomes. So hopefully we get a double benefit of there. Well, I love that because, as we know, um, there's not a lot of ticket splitting anymore. So it, it really could be a magnifying effect. As I have mentioned a few times, we know that people are going to be looking for volunteer opportunities. You've mentioned a few. Um, where else? Uh, but certainly you mentioned the Indivisible Vashon, uh, Get Out the Vote page. Uh, any other organizations that you would uh, advise people to familiarize themselves with right now or to get involved with? Well, on that page, you will find the battleground states that we mentioned. And uh, if you click on those battleground states, it'll introduce our volunteers to um, the organizations who are you know, creating those opportunities. But the other thing to notice, on the top of that Get Out the Vote page, there's a, a link to set up a Take Action Network search. And if people are not familiar with Take Action Network, uh, it's developed locally. Um, a member of the board of Fuse Washington uh, named Daniel Weiss is the creator of Take Action Network. Um, and it has action opportunities that people can take. And when you sign up for Take Action Network and you click on this spe specific elections-oriented search that we've created for you, anytime a new opportunity pops up for election volunteering, it'll show up as an email for you to determine whether you want to take those actions. So go ahead and go out to the, get out the vote page on Indivisible Vashon, click on that top box about joining Take Action Network, set up that search. All you got to do is click on the, on the link that's provided and you will become a member of Take Action Network and you'll get those email notifications. And that's how we plan to communicate um, in large part, you know, what these new volunteer opportunities are. Yeah, it's really going to be key. And I would just tell people, if you are interested in learning more about Take Action Network and also certainly its genesis, but also its 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 core operations, how it works, uh, there is a really good explainer pod that I did with Daniel Weiss, uh, the creator, and also Luis Pate, one of the, the leaders at Indivisible uh, uh, Eastside. And I will have that also for people in the show notes. Lots and lots of stuff in the show notes. So as I mentioned at the top, this is going to be an ongoing series uh, let's talk about what people can expect here. So we're going to have interviews with candidates, uh, also state and national organizers. Um, and then we're going to be doing something called uh, the state of the race. This is going to be a probably a monthly uh, update. What can people and this is going to be the two of us uh, doing what we do here. What can you tell us about that? What can people anticipate with state of the race? So state of the race is uh, kind of a snapshot of new learning things that our researchers have identified um, as redistricting maps become available in different states. We are expecting, you know, those local organizations to do some analysis on where the competitive races might shift around. So we'd basically like to be able to bring that to, to people's attention. Um, in, in the last cycles state of the race, you know, it was all about looking at the polling data and I can tell you that was very interesting, but we also know that the polling data is <laughs> really, um, you know, it's not really very reliable. Yes. And uh, that's a nice way. But, to it. Yeah. Yes. Um, but and so perhaps of the state of the race um, in 2020, it was basically looking at how the polling data had changed. Who's ahead? Who's behind? How, who has big margins that probably they don't need your support right now? who's starting to sink, who might need your support right now. It's not clear if we're really going to be able to have reliable polling data to go into that level of detail. But that's the idea. We'd like to bring those kind of insights to folks when they have to, you know, to have some choices about which state they want to support. But, you know, the other thing we said at the top of the show is, um, for example, if you hail from Pennsylvania, for example, and you really want to see Pennsylvania blue, then focus on Pennsylvania. You know, there's no wasted support here. Everything we do is to the good. And you just have to find that thing that uh, that really gets you up and uh, at the keyboard or at the phone or at the at the pen and pencil with those letters and postcards, because uh, that's that's what's going to really make make it uh, a winnable election for us. 
I, I think that is such a crucial point that I, I want to underscore it again. Uh, we know that people are so dispirited right now. And uh, I think anything ultimately that gets you personally motivated uh, and, and gets you off the sidelines and back in right now is worth doing. So whatever that is for you, uh, grab onto that. And we will have as much information as, as, as you can as you can digest here on this uh, this series going forward. Any uh, last thoughts before we go, Kevin? Well, is now a good time to make the ask, Stephen? Uh, what, pray tell, is the ask, Kevin? Uh, oh, the ask. So I, I would like people to know that um, the, for those who would like to join our scrappy band of researchers, and, and let me just clarify, it's, it, they're not scrappy researchers. It's right. just a, it's a scrappy band. They're, they're very talented researchers. Yep. Um, but it, but it, is, it is a small and scrappy group of people dedicated to finding these opportunities for volunteers across the state and possibly um, you know, across the country as we compile these resources to make sure that we get that election outcome that we want. So I would be more than happy to hear from the listeners who would like to join. You can email me directly, kevin at indivisiblevashon.org. I would love to hear from folks who want to make contributions in that way as well. We need you. We really, really need you. You're certainly not going to get that sort of <laughs> aptitude from me. I'm telling you right now, math is not my strong suit. So we, we, you, are, you are definitely needed. Well, Kevin, I'm very excited about this, man. Uh, thank you uh, for, for taking the time today. Thank you for all the work that you do. And as I say, we'll have all the information for everybody in the show notes and at indivisiblepodcast.org. And uh, Kevin, we will, uh, we will see you shortly for another update. Thanks so much, man. I'm looking forward to it, Stefan. Thanks again for the opportunity to chat today. And that'll do it for this week. If you would like to watch a video replay of this or any podcast, you can head to facebook.com slash indivisible podcast. The email address for the show is indivisiblepodcast at gmail.com. And you can follow us on Twitter at indivisible pod. Special thanks to Lori Caldwell. And as always, my thanks to you for listening. We'll talk to you next time. Bye.